and welcome back to the Religious Studies Project. We are here today for our June episode of Discourse, which is the RSP's monthly episode on how religion is discussed in the news media. I'm your host today. I'm Andy Alexander, and I have a great group of guests here today. Joining me is a longtime friend of the RSP, Miranda Simmons, and we have a newcomer as well, Ishanika Sharma. I will let them introduce themselves. Ishanika, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, Randy. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Ashanika Sharma, and I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of English at Emory University. Uh, my research is located at the intersections of um, trauma theory and post-colonial theory, and I'm very interested in how um, instances that we deem to be in the past, uh, traumatic events, um, st- you know, structural oppression, how those surface in our scripts of everyday life, so how they interrupt our um, experience of the present. So our discussion today is very consonant with, with my interests. Wonderful. And Marinda, can you tell us a little bit about your work? Hello. It's good to be with you both. Uh, my name is Marinda Simmons. I'm a professor of religious studies at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. My research and teaching mostly revolves around like how people tell stories about the past and how those stories reflect and produce power dynamics in the present. Um, so that brings a lot of stuff to the table, but I tend to focus on race, gender, sexuality, particularly in the Caribbean and the American South. Excellent. And yes, we are all located currently in the American South, which (laughs) is maybe one of the the closest regional episodes of discourse we've had in a while. Ground zero Uh, for this particular conversation, too. It really (laughs) is. So critical race theory. Let's, let's, this is going to be a lot to work through, obviously. (laughs) Thankfully, I have the two of you here. How about we just dive in from a definitional perspective? What exactly is critical race theory? And is that something is that something that maps onto what's going on? Is it as scary as it seems? (laughs) Um. (laughs) That is the question. So, like, simply put, right? Critical race theory just basically brings a structural emphasis on race and social social change to critical legal studies. Um, It grew out of uh, a lot of lawyers and scholars looking at legislation following the civil rights era. Um, The gains of that movement were really directly seen in the passage of uh, laws like Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, um, anti-discrimination laws that attempted to offer programs targeting specific disadvantages faced by African Americans, because one of the things that we learned through that struggle was that there were lots of um, spaces where discrimination was found and felt, um, that it wasn't just a a quick or easy uh, answer. So these new pieces of legislation got a ton of backlash, quick and strong, from white conservatives um, who were claiming that in specifically targeting African Americans, the laws were themselves racist, somehow t- tantamount to the Jim Crow laws that we were trying to move past and, and undo. This is where you get like the idea of you know reverse racism. Uh, so yeah, so scholars... Um, wanted to start examining how and why these legal gains that came from the civil rights movement were undermined and how laws and policies can respond to racial inequality. Um, So that really became the rallying point um, where it kind of like coalesced academically um, the late 80s. Uh, It is not a monolith. There are lots of different permutations. um, But But like in a nutshell, right, it just is examining how we codify race as an identification through our legal system and what effects those codifications have. Um, Because if race and racism are fashioned by way of legal structures, then we can start looking at the Constitution as maybe not such a neutral document. Um, 
concepts like intersectionality become mm-hmm. important, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, so in that sense, structural critique paves a way for social change. Yeah. I how How does critical race theory, based on this, what you've just outlined, how does that map onto what we're seeing in uh, news media currently? I think it's really helpful to think of it not as a monolith, right? So it, it is as, as, as an orientation toward thinking about racism or as a, as, as a manner of thinking itself. I mean, it, it is going to constantly get us to question um, the structures that we inherit and that we inhabit. And so this is not some sort of distilled body of knowledge that you can just sort of package up and say, here's us teaching critical race theory and like here it is in a K-12 context or here it is in uh, you know a diversity training module but all the same I think um, even when we clarify what critical race theory is and trace its origins back to the 70s and the 80s it's uh, it, it almost becomes besides the point when it comes to how it's being treated in news media today, right? It's it's almost like it doesn't matter what the clarification seeks to do because the term itself seems to be um, somewhat capacious and suggestive enough to have it uh, be associated with, with the kind of moral panic that you were talking about, Merinda, right? So it becomes like a catch-all term for everything from um, a, a sort of identity politics, wokeism, uh, you know, uh, political correctness. It's almost like everything that the political right deems dangerous for the body politic, um, you know, comes forth in this guise. And uh, it's, uh, you know, to to be fair, it's something that, uh, you know, incites a lot of um, rage and panic as, say, opposed to um, anti-racist pedagogy or, you know, anti-racist thought and initiative. I mean, a lot of people who perhaps uh, have not encountered critical race theory in uh, in the kind of educational settings that you were mentioning um, are, are, you know, likely to, to think of it as something that is going to identify um, individuals as being racist uh, while missing the point that, uh, you know, you, you may well not think of yourself as a racist, but still be embedded in structures which are going to grant you certain kinds of privilege, certain kinds of power. Um, so I, th- I think that contestation between uh, between a structural understanding of, of, of what racism is and what critical race theory was trying to point toward. So, yeah, I think there's, I think there's some real tension uh, between trying to understand the kind of um, structural issues to which critical race theory is, is directing our attention and the kind of um, impetus or the kind of um, the, the emphasis, I think, that it places on individuals to respond to this call or to recognize structures as being, um, you know, informative and, and, and formative of their of their personas and actions. That's a super important point, because, yeah, like a lot of the backlash and this is always I mean, this is this is nothing new um, yeah. in terms of how we kind of uh present social movements and then receive backlash against those movements and the rhetoric that's used um, in that process. Um, uh, I think about the rhetoric of individualism that was used to advocate for states' rights, um, uh, to, to you know, continue with segregationist um, laws. So, so while it's not new, um, it's it, it still retains then this this amazing traction um, and purchase this rhetoric of this is how I feel this is about me when uh, in, in response to a school of thought or a, 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 a curriculum or a um, anti racist initiative with diversity training or what have you um, that is looking very much at structure. Um, systemic uh, issues, um, phenomena that we face socially and institutionally, that the response to those initiatives and priorities is about how those make me feel and what they're saying about me in response is is a defensiveness that we're we're super familiar with, but that that never. Uh, 
really seems to go away. And I think that that, I mean, that defensiveness wouldn't exist if we really were confident about who we are in the world, right? If, um, if, if I'm, uh, I really like my glasses and someone comes along and says like, those are ridiculous glasses. That cool. Um, you know, fine. But if like I agonized over the choice and I'm not sure, and I'm really self-conscious and someone makes a comment about them, um, then I'm going to have a more defensive response. I mean, it is, it is this way about everything. If we were super confident that gender roles were innate and biological and across time and space, always the same forever and ever, we wouldn't bristle so much when a, a person disrupts those norms um, or transgresses a boundary. So, so it actually reveals the very tenuous uh, nature of, of racial um, uh, like, or the, the constructed nature um, and, and how contingent and tenuous it is the way that we create race in this country and have always. Yeah. What is fascinating about this binary that we're, that Shanika mentioned that we're seeing between individualism and structuralism, it, it does play out in a number of ways. And, and I think these uh, resolutions are a, a great example, of course, because critical race theory, the language of critical race theory does not actually appear in these resolutions, certainly not in the Georgia resolution. Absolutely. It's uh, it's sort of, uh, it, it's all over news media right now. Everyone without sort of doing a deep dive into what, it consti- uh, what, what constitutes this body of knowledge or uh, how it's been wielded in the past is sort of up in arms about what needs to be taught in schools, right? Um, but the term itself, of course, does not appear in the resolutions that that at least uh, Georgia and Alabama, I think, are, are putting out. I, I don't think it, you know it, it really appears in any other state resolution, as far as I'm aware. But there is a lot of language around uh, sort of um, making sure that um, students are not put in uh, in 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 any sort of situation which uh, accrues to them certain kinds of discomfort, guilt, psychological distress. So once again, and I think this is something that you were mentioning, Merinda. There's the sense of how does this make me feel, right? Like the the focus on the individual when when faced uh, with uh, with with this uh, body of knowledge that is talking about structures that are implicating them in a certain sense. So the bit that I find really fascinating about the language in the resolution is the kind of uh, disjunction that it tries to create between the individual experience and something like structural inheritance, right? So uh, this is this is very much language that is, that is talking about how uh, no individual by virtue of race or sex is going to bear responsibility for actions that have been committed by persons of the same race or sex in the past. So it's, it's almost as though each generation in this country begins with a, with a fresh slate, right? Everyone is granted an equal opportunity and equal position in society. And then what you make of it, uh, you know, it, it's really just on you. It, it it really comes down to you as an individual and how much uh, motivation you had or, you know, uh, what, what kind of problems you sort of invited and, and, and uh, how you ended up where you did, which seems to, uh, you know, completely detract attention from something like how uh, structural phenomena, uh, uh, you know, things like education, access to housing, how uh, the banking situation, how things like that are going to to undergird something of that individual experience, right? And uh, you know, c- coming back also to uh, to this uh, to the sense of um, the affect produced in the classroom while talking about um, while talking about this country's history of of of, uh, of slavery and of racist oppression. I mean, it's 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 really interesting to me that it sort of keeps on coming back to. Um, but we must make sure that students in the classroom do not uh, feel any sense of guilt or do not feel any distress. Uh, you know, which. Uh, 
uh, which which is interesting for <laughs> for a number of reasons, I think. One that there is really no way of knowing what you're going to encounter in the classroom and what kind of affect it's going to produce in you. There is no way to really gauge that affect. Uh, at the same time, it's difficult to say what the the role of education then would be. Are we then just sort of um, you know distilling material that is not supposed to unsettle uh, what people already know? Uh, you know, are, are are children not supposed to uh, grapple with with something of the structure that they have inherited? It, it you know. Uh, I, I think uh, it's important to, to sort of, uh, you know, put pressure on this language of affect and and, and instead sort of, um, you know, ch- change it to reflect something of the responsibility that we might still bear to uh, towards society, toward one another, without having to to think through, oh, this this renders me um, sort of helpless or always already guilty because, um, you know, I'm, I'm of a particular community. Um the uh, you know just uh, I, I think this is something that we've kind of said in different terms before, but just to reiterate, this is uh, what we're encountering in K to twelve context is is not even critical race theory per se, right? This is just history, so there right. is there is a sense of having to grapple with that anyway. And uh, you know, in, in in placing that sort of emphasis on on affect, on on, on psychological distress or uh, discomfort, um, you know, are, are we saying then that these uh, that these issues are going to become um, you know a, a no go um, in in the classroom? Uh, how exactly are we supposed to be talking about these issues? One of the things that yeah, that Alabama's resolution, um, the, the second draft, I think, is the most recent. Um, that it has in common with that is, yeah, this emphasis on um, inherency, you know, um, that the United States of America is not inherently a racist country. The state of Alabama is not an inherently racist state. Uh, no individual by virtue of his or her race or sex is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive. Um, and I mean, in, in that sense, like, uh, yeah, that, that is, is, a, a big part, like that's a kind of analytical cornerstone of critical race theory and social theory in general, that like people and countries and ideas are not inherently anything that we mm-hmm. create these out, that they are forged from very specific fires that get set in different ways, using different tools by different people for different reasons. And, and then the effects of those go on to live specific lives. Um, and then what do we do about those uh, and, and how do we respond to those effects? Um, but it is the, like, there is a tension that I hear you both kind of um, uh, talking about that I, I think is a really important one about the, um, on one hand, the need to, embrace or reify, um, you know, individual feeling and affect. Um, and on the other hand, this need to, uh, uh, issue inherent, um, being. (laughs) So there's like, it, it needs to cut both ways in that sense, um, for, uh, these critics and, um, critics of critical race theory. Um, one of the, um, I, I don't know what the type, like the name of Georgia's resolution is. The one in Alabama is Alabama State Board of Education Resolution. I wrote it out so that I would remember it. Declaring the preservation of intellectual freedom in Alabama's public schools. And so like, of course it's called that, right? Um, it's not about uh, like, we don't like critical race theory. Like, of course it is, but it is. It, the the way that we um, uh, yeah the the way that the the language is being used in order to uh, that, who, whose effect is critiquing critical race theory um, and and saying I don't want to feel X Y or Z is something declaring the preservation of intellectual freedom and who doesn't want to declare intellectual freedom. Right. Um, but in the process of declaring our preservation of intellectual freedom, um, as both of you said, there's not, uh, 
there's no mention of what we are preserving it in the face of. Um, critical race theory isn't mentioned as a term um, necessarily uh, from, you know, and, and it's, it's not also though, importantly, um, like I was saying earlier, mentioned so much as a term, at least in Alabama, like in the social studies curriculum in schools, you know, and, and in this board meeting where this resolution was um, discussed, they didn't describe um, specific schools or curriculum that they take issue with. The one thing that they did talk about was like the hypothetical use of the 1619 project in classrooms, which we can like nutshell later if we want to, but like this idea of like this, this phantasm of, well, you know, they might go on to, to teach this kind of thing. um, If we don't preserve our intellectual freedom, do you see what I mean? So like it's, it's in, in order to preserve intellectual freedom, we need to ban or, or, uh, create boundaries around certain kinds of curriculum. Yeah, that I think exactly. Ish- Ishanika, you were saying earlier is, is kind of just history. Like history is never neutral. History is never objectively narrated, but in terms of like what kinds of uh, like just archival work we're doing or talking about or what, what archives we give students access to, um, that, that does turn into for a lot of folks, this, um, uh, yeah, this very kind of threatening force that makes them feel certain things. I was listening to your conversation in an earlier episode, discourse episode with, um, Leslie, our dear friend, Leslie Dura Smith and, um, and Hannah, like Leslie at one point brings up uh, Lauren Berlant, whose idea I think is really, mm. uh, yeah. salient here too, about the, um, the language of trauma that people use in order to talk about their experience of privilege being exposed. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so yep. there are, structural traumas, systemic discriminations, these moments and and pieces of legislation and history that we can point to, um, policies still on the books that we can point to. The, um, Ava DuVernay's 13th uh, documentary, mm. I think, is a really good example of this, um, of how the ways that we codify race and our responses to it in this country um, have certain effects, like prison industrial complex, yada, yada. Um, but there is also this piece of the, the the affect from folks that we're talking about who are afraid of these approaches, um, who use very similar rhetoric to talk about what what they're experiencing when they um, are made to feel, you know, um, uh, racist or whatever, um, are, are made to feel this kind of distress. Um, the white women crying at, at, you know, claims of being racist or whatever, being called out. Um, and and what that is, is this phenomenon of like, it, it's not that I have to feel, it's not that people have to, um, uh, that, that instead of, you know, experiencing um, disproportionate incarceration rates or disproportionate suspension rates at school, like any number of things that we can point to um, that people of color deal with in this country. Um, We instead can point to just your pointing out my privilege as something that is deeply distressing to me and that that the use of this is Berlant's idea of that, that idea of trauma being the language that we've got to, or that a lot of white folks have to talk about what it is that they experience when we have our privilege called out. We're just named. Those are really compelling points. I mean, you know, that this, this emphasis on on the rhetoric of trauma or an affect to detract then from 
uh, you know, detract attention from the very structures that is uh, leading to that kind of privilege that is being called out, right? I think that it, that is just, um, uh, you know, it, it's um, it's obfuscatory. It, it's um, it, it defeats the point. It, it takes away the momentum from um, from from thinking about these issues. That said, I I, I really do think it's not something that's happening on on the political right. Um, only right mm. like this 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 yeah. this language of affect is 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 not just um, pertinent to to that side it just it seems to um it seems to percolate around this 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 binary of of, of structural mm-hmm. versus individual which which we're trying to i think unpack a little bit uh, around this whole issue um you know, it, it's uh, it, it it's difficult to have to think about how structures are um, both containing as well as defining you, and at the same time try and take some sort of individual responsibility to try then to to um, you know allow for more equitable or or just systems to exist. Mm-hmm. What then you know uh, uh, how. Or where do we locate individual agency? What do we think about uh, responsibility uh, outside of uh, you know the the rhetoric of of affect alone, right? Um, I, I, w- I was thinking about how uh, you know so, some of this even surfaces in the work of Isabel Wilkerson, who who put out a, a very um, interesting book on on caste last year, right? It, I think it's called. Um, Cast the origins of our discontents, and uh, I, mean, I mean, there she's sort of going back um, to this idea of how race relations in the U.S. Uh, would be better understood through the the frame of the Indian caste system, um, insofar as uh, caste is something like the the invisible skeleton or the the DNA of race relations in the U.S. Right? So she, uh, you know, she. she Advances this whole um, idea that uh, we, we would it would better serve our purposes to think about um, an, an artificial hierarchy that is regulating relations, that is re- regulating um, interactions, both economic, social, and otherwise, um, through the rubric of caste, um, and that it is in the interest of the upper caste to sort of um, to protect their privilege and to not allow for um, cross caste um, association to exist. Um, now, I mean, there were, you know, a lot of work has been done, um, you know, in, in, in trying to push back against this idea that perhaps caste is the best way in which to think about race in the US. And, and I mean, lots of people have done the work of sort of pushing back against that idea and saying, well, here are the reasons for which the, um, you know, the uh, translation does not quite um, settle well. Um what what I think is super interesting in in relation to the conversation that we've been having is that Wilkerson recognizes that race um, and all its uh, attendant sort of uh, problems are very much structural in nature. So she continuously draws attention to how, even as say uh, as a caste system, that these are um, you know structurally undergirded, that it is uh, you know uh, that political and economic and um, sort of uh, um, legal institutions um, are uh, predisposed toward protecting certain privilege, certain power. Uh, and yet, after having set up this whole structural phenomenon, she um, she uh, looks towards something um, as, as, as radical empathy to try and uh, resolve this conflict. Right. So after having recognized that this is a structural problem and that, you know, it is going to um, place people in, in various hierarchi- hierarchical positions wherein they will accrue that privilege and they will likely, uh, you know, step on others to be able to do that. Um, here she is uh, offering radical empathy as as the way out, which um, I mean, you know, which. I think is 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 a rather um, rich concept, but I, I think it somewhat sort of falls short of the kind of problem that she's just described, right? Because once again, we're sort of in this um, individualistic 
register once again we're talking about emotions and that to having to appeal to the the uh you know the dominant power groups right so um the privileged white in this uh, instance and and having to appeal to their uh sensibility to say well here are the ways in which we too are human or here are the ways in which we can sort of transcend this um you know caste contract and and meet each other halfway or what have you and this this empathy is really sort of uh, it, it's dicey it's dubious to me right this this uh, it, it's um I mean, it, it, it's well intentioned, but at, at the same time, it's it's almost like having recognized um, our, our structural interest, you know, our, our our structural undergirding. We we have nowhere else to turn to, but but almost inward, right? And uh, I mean, I, I would be I'd be interested in sort of um, seeing how we can um, think about the language of responsibility that does not. Uh, you know, just uh, hem the individual in, in into their sort of own own world. Um, yeah, you know, if, if if empathy alone were sort of enough to to um, to squash this issue or, or to, to stop it from really propagating, then I mean, well, we would we would not be here. Then Atticus Finch would have saved us all back, <laughs> way back when. Exactly. <laughs> But Absolutely. that does, fit. I mean, that is, that is, yeah, totally. Still, it's a really useful point. Um, it, it is still an idea that has, um, a lot of purchase on the left. Um, I'm thinking in a, in a non academic context, the, um, uh, D'Angelo's White Fragility, the popularity of that book, the way that a lot of um, uh, responses to the kinds of horrors that we've been seeing play out on the news and in the world around us is this kind of like um, how to change your heart and mind. Um, and, it, and, and, we, and we should get more self-aware. We should examine our own, you know, that, again, it, it's, 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 use, yeah. it's, it's useful but there's a way that it can kind of reproduce some of the uh, yeah. logic that we also then see in these conservative backlashes to attempts to approach things structurally. It's a Fox News story from Sam Dorman and the caption at the start of the piece, the caption struck me when I was oh, looking ahead. at it earlier. And it says the spread of critical race theory in schools has sparked controversies across the country. And I think that the, again, like this kind of circles back to an earlier point that, um, that you were making about like, you know, where the, onus lies um and 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 how we start tracing some kind of like first this happened and so then this happened um that that it's the spread of critical race theory in schools that has sparked controversies um rather than like no my dude like your anxiety was triggered and so you're creating controversy like the criticism about critical race theory is not about critical race theory. It's about the critics of your right? like that's where the criticism and that's social theory 101. Um, this I this idea that like if you are responding in this way, that is because of you. Um and the, you know, again, the, the right has been so effective at weaponizing that very idea um in its, you know, critiques of liberal snowflakes, etc. But um but yeah, like I, I think well, it's really think, interesting yeah. in in some of these news stories about like how the the controversy is framed. Um, you know, uh, what is doing something to whom and how um, is 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 going to change a lot depending on what media outlet um, is is talking about the story. Oh, yeah, and effective moral panic that it is, it also distracts from. Um, realities like economic disparity, economic precarity, mm -hmm. the resources belonging to schools, et, the, et cetera, in, in regions like the Deep South, all yeah. like that would like around which um, we might build coalition and and change things in a in a broader structural way, because it, it instead we create the 
the the phantasm, the the kind of like uh, ghost of critical race theory that's going to haunt the classrooms instead of it, it, that that keeps us from looking at like like how how recent are our textbooks? How how well equipped are our computer labs? What are our like what are our breakfast programs like in public schools? How does mm-hmm. like those things now are not it, the, the the ones who are creating this panic are wealthy donors um, and and lobbyists. They are members of boards of education. They are people who who do not actually have to um, uh, live with those again structural realities. It is a ten- it, it's it's a uh, it, it's it. This is a tangent that we won't like. It's a rabbit hole we won't go down, and maybe it's a part two discussion of something. But like, it's no um, coincidence that part of the backlash against the civil white rights programs um, that I was talking about at the outset um, very much uh, played into what many historians identify as the rise of the contemporary religious right, um, such that so-called segregation academies were wanting to not respond to new legislation saying, actually, integration is kind of a thing you need to do. Um, and, And again, in the name of individualism, privatization, we should be able to make our own decisions for our own schools because of our own communities and religious convictions, um, that no, we get to do what we want. Um, and, and so there was a real, uh, struggle about the, um, tax exempt status of a lot of these, um, Mm -hmm. a lot of these schools like Bob Jones university that refused to integrate when they were expressly told to do so um, by the federal government, and and so there again, like it's no um, like this is this is all part of the same uh, context. It's all part of the same history. Um, the the sixteen nineteen project. Nicole mm-hmm. Hannah Jones, the uh, journalist who is a Pulitzer Prize winner. She's a recipient of a MacArthur Genius Grant, um, and she's the journalist behind sixteen nineteen project. Now. That is such a good example of how histories are never neutral or objective stories, um, mm-hmm. how the way that we uh, uh, lay out a historical narrative is very much going to affect um, the ways that it's received by different yeah. you know, groups of people. Um, there are, I, I think, valid um, or, or at least critiques that deserve to be considered of 1619 project from um, uh, Marxist thinkers, yeah, um, uh, you know, class critics who talk about the um, the way that the project uh, emphasizes humanism in a way that collapses uh, the very complicated and um, very real history of slavery as as an economic. Uh, reality um, as a as mm-hmm. a labor as a as a system of labor exploitation etc. Um, but the yeah. sixteen nineteen project is not obviously like a problem to critics of critical race theory because of her like not talking enough about labor. Um, it's it is a target um, because she just. Uh, commemorates the arrival of the first enslaved Africans. She highlights the role that slavery played in America's past in order to tell the story of America's origins as such, like the, the, the plot of land that came to be called the United States, um, that part of the formation of that nation state, I mean, that, the formation, like it, the, its cornerstone is yeah. the African slave trade. And, um, Oh, Yes, and absolutely. so, yeah, and so, so while um, neutrality is 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 kind of a a a, a myth, um, at the same time, like it is an archival journalistic project, and the controversy 
that is still ongoing of Hannah Jones being Nicole Hannah Jones being um, offered at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill um, this you know chair in race and investigative reporting. Um, to folks who have held that position in the past, they all automatically get tenure because of course they do, because it's this endowed chair position, um, it's professorship, whatever, and um, wealthy donors and folks who have their own names on UNC buildings um, really strongly um, uh, protested that, um, talked to very powerful people making decisions and said, no, this is not who we want uh, at our esteemed institution. And so then what they said is, okay, well, let's not offer tenure. Let's just offer a kind of fixed contract situation. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's such a, it's such a good example of how folks are on the right responding to what they perceive to be um, the overreach of critical race theory, uh, of, of its, uh, indoctrinating power. Um, you know, and, and there was a, there was a recent piece about her case, um, and its first amendment implications, um, whether it's a a first amendment issue. And she makes the, a good point that, that you made earlier, Shanika, about like, while, there have been plenty of examples of like professors with controversial opinions and, and those have gone through courts, et cetera. There aren't a lot of cases that involve professors being punished for like providing objective facts, you know, um, of, of presenting archival material that is really painful and really difficult and that should make us uncomfortable if we are sentient beings. Um, and, and so it, it really has become, uh, an interesting case that way, um, because what that project does while, again, there are all sorts of, I think, valid and useful critiques that should be engaged. Um, it, they at least start from the same baseline that like, this is an archive that exists, right? Um, so, so just even how that becomes shifting sand in the, um, in the conversations that come out of this, uh, I think is, is really important to consider. I absolutely agree with what you're saying, Miranda. In fact, I think it's, it's so interesting that, um, the, the move to, to block tenure for Nicole Hannah Jones was, was coming from somebody whom you would think of as a, as an ally, for that particular chair and for that particular department, right? This is very much somebody uh, aligned with the publishing business and, you know, who you would sort of um, slot on the same side of the, the First Amendment, if you will. So, yeah, right. that's, yeah, just a quick... Well, I, um, one of the pieces of, I haven't read George's resolution um, super closely, but one of the things that uh, stuck out to me at first uh, first read was this like idea that the uh, advent of slavery in the territory that is now the United States, um, you know, it, 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 that we stand against the notion that the advent of slavery in the territory that is now the U.S. like constituted the true founding of the U.S. You know, um, so that even that becomes that 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 slavery was like part of that that was that was legislated written like built into our foundation um and that there was a a phenomenally complex and transnational imperial st- set of structures that perpetuated that for hundreds of years um is is something that uh, becomes its own kind of like debatable point um, for a lot of folks. And I think that just that phenomenon, um, but, but I mean, again, like this isn't, this isn't anything new. Like this is, you know, in, in the conversation of this era of like alternative facts and stuff um, on, on one hand, the, 
uh, just, just person who like lives through a Tuesday in me wants to say like, just, just, yeah, but this is a thing that is true on the other, like, <laughs> like there is a, <laughs> there is a cloud in the sky. I will call it cloud. Um, on the other hand, like we social theorists know that like, that that we that knowledge has always been something that is um, uh, a, a, an energy ball that is picked up and dropped by different people at different times and tossed around and it, it is a like knowledge systems are made and unmade and what we think mm-hmm. is true about how we define this or that um, you know, what a what a woman's body was just a few hundred years ago is not at all what we understand it to be today. I mean, there are so many examples of that. And so, again, like this is one of the ways that I think the right has has been really effective rhetorically um, at at pulling at certain threads um, in the the very, um, uh, you know, true phenomenon that like stories do get told with bias to then create like this is the new world order this is a this is a reality now that this is a you know that we either have to protect or protect our children against um yeah what's kind of interesting too in that that part that you mentioned is um the to quote it here it says that the advent of slavery and the territory territory that is now the united states uh saying that this is not the case right um uh, constituted the true founding of the United States. Right. right. And that's what right. I, like, then in the next point, it's saying that um, slavery and racism, much like Joe Biden has said so many, many times since he was elected, quoting here, are derivations from betrayals of or failures to live up to the authentic founding principles of the United States, which include liberty and equality. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's great that you draw attention to that language, Andy. It's uh, it's it's the fresh start, right? The the true founding, the, like all of that, is now disavowed. That has nothing to do with the founding, the true one, and that's going to perpetuate itself. I mean, um, I, I think uh, it, it gives us a nice little parallel to consider why uh, you know why the education system or why children are now serving once again as like that that figure, the, the you know that that clinches together this culture war right like uh, it's children it's you know they're going to go on and lead meaningful lives and it's a fresh start for them they're full of potential they're on their way to becoming fully fleshed out individuals and uh, nothing of the systems in which you know that that they've inherited are are, are going to impact that of course not so you know there seems to be like a like a like an each generation begins a new sort of, uh, you know, rhetoric, um, both for the nation as well for the, for the children. And, and of course, I mean, one way of, of interrupting that would be to, uh, to reckon with the history of, of racial oppression, of injustice in this country. And, uh, you know, I, I think that is, that is necessarily one that is going to produce discomfort, that is going to produce, um, a, you know, um, some, some feelings that, um, that, that don't quite, um, correspond with this this other myth that we have of this nation right the, the with, with with the american dream it's just it's going to be that way and i think you know kind of uh, how i think uh, we, we were speaking earlier and i think uh Melinda, you brought up lauren berland's uh work on this uh, you know what if we what if we both take in our stride the affect that it generates as well as uh you know move beyond that to to look at more productive ways of attending to these issues. Well, and I think that's, that is kind of the key thing in, in a lot of ways, because when we see the language of the resolution about, you know, the founding of the United States, right? Again, back to what, Miranda, you were saying earlier, there is no neutral historical narrative, right? Like, as is made very clear by this resolution, right? And and so, like, yes, it's easy to say, ah, see, we're all doing this, it doesn't matter, or they're doing it too, kind of, you know, some sort of whataboutism. And that's, I don't think, the point, really, because it's going to happen, it's going always going to happen and keep happening, because none of these issues are new, right? And and I think that's, you're right, Ishaka, it's like, we need to find a way, and I think that's part of this, is looking 
at breaking down the distinctions that we are so very comfortable with and that we like to assert very frequently between the individual and structural issues and and figure out like we you know we can't escape that right it's this is part of how we understand ourselves our social worlds like i don't know how we could even think outside of that but we can still try to th- shift our focus and 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 you know wrestle with the discomfort of recognizing how we are at once agential beings but at the same time like implicated in this structural like system and and that takes time it takes work it's not comfortable one of the things that i kind of um bristle at with the uh okay what i call the Atticus Finch brand of race politics um, is that in a focus on uh, affect and um, uh, individualism, um, there is a blind eye kind of cast toward what work is involved in structural organizing, building, unbuilding, um, that, that that work that critical race theory asks us to bring our attention to is often mundane, is very quotidian, the work of community organizing and, um, and, and legislating is, is something that's not quite as romantic as a lot of our sort of grand narratives that, that, um, that I think follow up a sort of arc that we're familiar with that we enjoy a little bit more. Um, I, I actually, I saw a, um, it was a good, you know, piece in the Washington post uh, about, you know, what it is that um, uh, makes white folks see um, critical race theory as a threat, et cetera. And one of the things that stuck out was that they, that the article itself used systemic racism, like in scare quotes. And it occurred to me that one of the things that I hope like folks in years to come will find very archaic about the ways that we were talking about race and discrimination in 2020 is that we still, even on the left felt like struck, like systemic racism needs to be a thing in scare quotes, um, because again, we can't even agree that that's like a thing that exists. Um, uh, you would think that a focus on a system would make folks feel better about not being individually called out, but again, that's not how defensiveness works. Um, and so, yeah, in terms of sitting with the discomfort, uh, well, I'm all here for sitting with the metaphor. discomfort. <laughs> <I'm just gonna laughs> no, I'd love it. to hear what you <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh, it's my favorite. All right. So, um, when I was in uh, my own origin narrative, when I was in graduate school, um, I uh, was reading Toni Morrison's Playing in the Dark. Um, I think a lot of the listeners will be familiar with that text. Um, it's one of her uh, critical pieces. It's brief. Um, she's doing like a reading of early American literature that like became canon. And what she suggests is the Africanist presence that it relies upon. And, um, and uh, because she's Toni Morrison, she gives such uh, cool language to um, what I was sort of s- swimming in um, that, 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 I don't know, was laden with a lot of jargon at the time um, about, about structures and hegemony and uh, all sorts of things. So she said, As a writer reading, I came to realize the obvious. The subject of the dream is the dreamer. It is as if I'd been looking at a fishbowl, the glide and flick of the golden scales, the green tip, the bolt of white careening back from the gills, the castles at the bottom, surrounded by pebbles and tiny intricate fronds of green, the barely disturbed water, the flecks of waste and food, the tranquil bubbles traveling to the surface. And suddenly I saw the bowl. The structure that transparently and invisibly permits the ordered life it contains to exist in the larger world. 
And it was just, it's, it's a metaphor that I return to over and over again. And I um, talk about it a lot with students too, when it can get really complicated to think about the, yeah, the, the relationship between individual and system and social construction and um, uh, self-identification, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think her metaphor is so useful at, at showing how the thing that we're looking at, the, the little castle and the little fish, um, a thing called race, a thing called gender, a thing called, you know, groovy eyeglasses that someone tries to make a statement with, whatever, right? Like the thing that we think we're looking at is always going to be contained inside of a structure that if it's working properly, we never even notice. And we, that we only notice the structure when it's, when something's wrong with it, when it needs fixed, when we need to. And so calling attention to it when it's working properly or as folks in power want it to work is absolutely going to be uncomfortable. Um, like it's, it, that is, that is what it is. And it's, um, and, and I, I don't know, I I just think it's a really good metaphor for thinking about structure and like, and individual in relation, the thing and the structure that contains and makes possible the thing. That is really evocative. <laughs> Such a good thought. Also, like the structures are invisible, but they're not, they're never vacuums. You know what I mean? Well, like, exactly. The phenomenon of disproportionate suspension from school or disproportionate like incarceration rates for black folks, like is not, a thing that exists in a vacuum, it, that it exists inside of a containing structure that makes it possible. Um, and so what does it mean to like do the work of, of looking at those structures? Yeah, I think that, that's the key thing. And I think that, you know, partly, I think one of the reasons the same, you know, issue kind of reemerges, um, in new ways, but kind of ultimately the same thing, uh, is because we we keep not looking at the structure, right? We keep trying to ignore the fishbowl and consistently um, in our history. And, and sometimes I think, you know, there are ways that the times that the structure is acknowledged enough, you know, like, okay, well, we're kind of doing something here, but ultimately, not much changes, right? And I think that is is really why we need <laughs> to have critical race theory, to be like, I don't know, well-versed in social theory more generally, because that's what will allow us to actually talk about what's going on rather than just repeating the same, you know, kind of talking points every time it comes up again. So I do think that's a great metaphor. Um, we have been talking for a while and honestly this really could go on as long as we wanted to because it there's so much to say um but we should probably wrap it up but no this has been great like thank you so much for being here especially i think this is fantastic for our you know final episode of season 10 10 years amazing Congratulations! Yes, is there like a tenth anniversary cake or something? So there was you guys a can share cyberly. There was the cake, Andy. Where's the cake? <laughs> you know, I feel happy like- anniversary, RSP. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you for. I mean, just a wonderful episode. So great to have the both of you here to wrap up this season. I also want to say thanks again to all of our listeners and for your support um, this season. Of course, over the past ten years now, um, you know this wouldn't be possible without all of you around the world. And, you know, we hope that you are enjoying our episodes. And if you are able, we would absolutely love any support that you could give us. Please, you know, head over to um, our Patreon at patreon.com slash project RS to sign up for a monthly donation. You know, $1 a month would go a long way to helping offset some of the labor for our team and all the work that they're doing here. So I guess we're done for now. We'll be back in August. Date TBD. Um, (laughs) Thank you 
Marinda, Ishanika. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. This is really fun. It was, it was. And I guess until August, all that's left to say is thanks, thanks for, for listening. listening. The RSP is sponsored by the BASR, NAASR and the IAHR and is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation. Find out more at religiousstudiesproject.com. Brought to you by editors Brianne Fallon and David McConaughey and founding editors Chris Cotter, that's me, and David Robertson, that's the other guy. Our features are edited by Rebecca Barrett-Fox and Lauren Osborne and our Opportunities Digest by Ella Bach. Audio editing by Alex Matthews, podcast transcription by Andy Alexander and Savannah Finver, and social media managed by Ray Radford and Candice Mixon. Don't forget you can support the project by using our Amazon affiliate links or donating at patreon.com backslash project RS. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, and other portals. Thanks for listening.